Hey folks, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, and today we're going to talk about hafting Clovis points. And along with hafting Clovis points, we have to discuss the other artifacts found in the Clovis assemblage, like you're going to see behind me. So we're going to jump right into this, and we're going to knock out some really important pieces, and hopefully you'll leave out of here understanding Clovis hunting technology a little bit better. And I just wanted to let you know that we also have a full-length Clovis documentary. This is not in that documentary. This is an expansion on some of the short discussion we did about some of the artifacts found in the Clovis assemblage. So you're going to see a lot of new content in this one, but if you've not seen the other Clovis, the full-length documentary, we touch on so much more about the Clovis build hunt and butcher kit that's not covered in this video so make sure you check out that link if you've not watched it already all right let's get into this on discussing how clovis are most likely hafted and how we use them on our clovis era style of bison hunts and there's a few components that we're going to look at specifically from the clovis assemblage and that is you know artifacts that are actually excavated from clovis manufacture sites or kill sites and those specifically that we're talking about today are of course the fluted points the fluted clovis points and then also the single beveled antler bone ivory rods typically pointed on one side like this one and then uh beveled to be lap jointed on the other side and then also the bi beveled rods and so as we go through what's drawn here on the board, we'll also overlay some photos from our actual build and hunt sequences. And then we'll also explain some of the things on here that are actually not found in the Clovis assemblage, which really helps to play the process of elimination game to determine how Clovis truly were hafted. So if you're here and you probably already know what Clovis is, but for that overview for anybody that may be relatively new to it, Clovis projectile points specifically having very distinct what's called fluting on the, the basal sides of the points, oftentimes a bifurcated, so it's uh, recessed in and fluted. Not always, but Clovis points in general have some degree of fluting flake removal at the base and some have a little deeper hinged flutes and then some have feathered out flutes uh, there's a lot of variations in that but that's basically what you're looking at with your standard clovis projectile point which obviously makes it very recognizable to a lot of people now without a doubt as you see this diagram we put fletchings on this side of the spear shaft to indicate that they were most likely fletched because fletched spear shafts or dart shafts fly significantly better and with all the other advancements that we see within clovis people having fletchings is really an easy thing to figure out and then also understanding that they were absolutely using the atlatl system not thrusting spears or throwing javelin types of spears and that we absolutely know because of the size of the projectiles are very very small and then also our tests within the hunts showing that you would have a massive failure of penetration simply by hand throwing these spears really at any distance with these projectiles that we're finding in the Clovis sites. And then couple that with the fact that the atlatl has been around for plus 40,000 years, possibly even back into the hundreds of thousands of years in modern day Europe and Asia, and the earliest people moving into North America, definitely earlier than say, as we know now, 16,000 plus years ago, before Clovis people, they would have been able to migrate to North and South America with the atlatl system. So very confident that the atlatl is what is delivering the spear shaft, which is also tipped with relatively small projectile points that are most closely associated with megafauna, proboscideans, you know, any sort of elephant species, mammoths, mastodons, even the gompotheres, and then also bison and tegus. So moving on now to the single beveled and pointed antler bone ivory 
uh, points just like this or pieces and I absolutely believe that these are a projectile point and so they are single beveled on one side which lends itself and they're actually scored as well typically all the way around to give a good mating surface so when you attach these to a four shaft or a spear shaft with this lap jointed system glue it with a pine pitch glue which we know has been around for a very long time and then wrap it with animal tendons and that creates a very secure hafting joint and so that can withstand a tremendous amount of force being exerted on it through penetration and also quite a bit of side to side flex as we can actually use these lap joints as you'll come to find out in the middle of the spear shaft which flexes in flight especially upon initial launching and they're very very strong joints and they are apparent on almost all of the pieces that we find within the beveled rods, bi-beveled rods, single beveled rods in the Clovis assemblage. So these pieces here that we looked at made from bone, antler, or ivory, uh, for a while were thought to have been four shafts sticking down into the end of spear shafts. And there's a couple problems with that. Number one, they're, they're quite sharp at the distal end. So they're really made for penetration. There would be no reason to severely taper and sharpen the tip if it was going to sit down into a foreshaft like this because as it, as it gets force pressed into it with penetration, it's only going to promote it to penetrate. You'd actually want to blunt this off and round it, not sharpen it. And then if we look at Let's say we'll start with this diagram here, as we've already discussed, attaching to the end of a four shaft or a spear shaft itself with that lap joint. This makes a projectile point that although it doesn't have a lot of lacerative qualities, meaning it doesn't have any cutting edges, so it's not really going to cut when it goes in. I don't know anybody that would want this thing running through them either. So it's a great hole poker, but also keep in mind that these would be exceptionally good for practicing and then also using on small game. So you could actually throw these at stuff like rabbits as well and actually pin them to the ground with these, uh, these spike style of points where you can then also while you're carrying all your spears as a nomadic person, if you come across animals and you're throwing spears, these can also be implemented in your big game hunting as large hole poking projectiles, where if you watch the Clovis documentary we previous did, we showed that the simple hardwood tipped spear shafts, so just spear shafts with no sort of point other than the natural hardwood, which would be fire hardened and sharpened, really lacked in penetration and sometimes completely bounced off because the tip of wood is so soft that it rolls where the tip of bone antler and ivory is very hard and therefore will not roll upon impact and you'll get penetration. So all of that stuff put together really shows that these are great projectile points with a multi-purpose use. One of the things that these have been proposed to be used for is found here in the second drawing, which is a great idea. And modern humans love to over engineer things, right? So we love to sit down and get our minds working and say, man, we could, we could put this together and we'd have all these pieces and it would be so cool. And this is exactly how it worked. And we have to remember that although these people were really intelligent and they made very fine pieces, over engineering this stuff as modern humans is really pointless to early people. The simplest answer, it's not that they're not smart enough to do it, they absolutely are, but the s simplest answer is oftentimes the best answer. And the reason is, is because the more pieces that you have put together, the greater risk of failure that will occur in a hunting scenario. So the least amount of pieces that you can put together and have to make all of these different components and then marry them together, we're decreasing the time of manufacture and we're also decreasing the amount of failure of this whole system in a hunt by basically getting rid of it. So what I'm saying is the more work, the more moving parts, the more in, little intricate pieces you put together, the higher 
chance of failure and then also the higher time of manufacture. So what has been proposed in the past was that the sharpened ends of the single beveled rods were four shafts that set down into a main shaft. But also keep in mind that a lot of these are as short as four inches, sometimes even less, and then as great as 16 inches, which that's fine, but those are the longer ivory ones that they would find, especially like down in Florida. So very short, much like this one here, it's about, I don't know, about six inches. So if this sat down into a four shaft, you would be looking at about, all about four inches or so exposed, and then a point. And we'll talk about the penetrative qualities in a little while, we'll, so we'll move on from there. But if this was to set down in, and then the idea is that this would be the side profile of the Clovis point, and that it would marry on to the side of the fluting, and then another additional piece, like a bone splint, would be made to tie this all together, and then wrap it up. Well, the big problem that you're going to find here is when you take a Clovis point, and this is an actual, this is a cast of a real Clovis point, so it's plastic, but it's an exact cast copy. And if you take these lap jointed ends or these beveled ends and you set it on the bi beveled or the single beveled rod, you can see that the tip alignment is really far off. And tip alignment is really important for penetration because imagine if this was hafted like this at this really tilted angle and then you throw it into an animal, it's going to want to fold and break that point in half very, very easily. So it's going to not only break your point very often, but it's also going to really inhibit penetration into the animal because instead of all of the energy behind the spear shaft being focused on penetrating in and through the animal, it's going to deflect energy upon impact downwards or upwards or whichever way it's canted. And it's going to create that leverage point, which is robbing energy really needed for penetration of large Pleistocene mammals. And most likely not only failing to penetrate, but also deflecting energy down, curving the penetration pattern of the projectile if not snapping the point altogether. So we have a significant issue with the way that these would be hafted on these beveled end pieces stuck down into a foreshaft. Also these bone splints, for all the research I've ever done, I have never seen a single splint that would fit on any of this found in the Clovis assemblage. However, there are bone antler and ivory artifacts found on Clovis uh, kill and manufacture sites, yet none of these bone splints seem to appear. So the other really big red flag in this is if these were set into drilled four shafts in the end of hardwood spears, that would require a tool known as, easy enough, a drill. And the major problem that we have is that these styles of drills are not found in the Clovis era. These long drills that would be used for actually drilling out the ends of hardwood spears do not come around until a couple thousand years after Clovis and really in the transitional paleo times, say around Dalton period, is when you really start seeing these drills showing up. So if you don't have the drill, then how are you drilling out the ends of hardwood spears? So what we're running into is we're really coming up with a lot of big problems with these being used as four shafts because we're lacking the drills in the Clovis assemblage. We're lacking the bone splint in the Clovis assemblage. The uh, tip alignment is horribly off on a beveled rod. And then also the tips are very sharp, which are not good for setting down into uh, these more rounded out drill face because very sharp drill tips break off, so they have to be somewhat rounded. All that's going to do is jam that further down into the spear shaft, even if you did drill it out. 
And then also the size of these, as we move over and start showing this, sitting down into, well, you would have to really bevel those in, uh, the shoulders of the shaft, which if you bevel the shoulders of the shaft in too hard, now it makes this union where these two come together very flimsy. Even if you wrap that with sinew or gut material, it still creates a very flimsy union, very, very thin, and it promotes snapping, especially if your tip alignment's off. So if your tip alignment's off, now you're getting extra torque, especially using leverage, down here at the union of the foreshaft. And so it's going to snap that really, really easily. And if you leave it full, fully shouldered, then as you see here where I just messed it up with my finger, the really pronounced shoulders of a spear shaft that has a foreshaft stuck down in it is going to drastically inhibit penetration. So if you're talking about point or these, if these were four shafts, which we know they're not, but if they were, and this was set down in, and we only had a couple inches, then there's really little penetration going on because these hard stopped shoulders will absolutely stop penetration. And we know that because we also specifically make our cane spear shafts, which we'll talk about in a moment, but we specifically make our cane spear shafts with these long hardwood four shafts that will penetrate in deep into the animal and then they stop penetration. And so these smooth transitions, as you can see on this point here, slide cleanly over. There's really no hangups and penetration. It slides right through and then it stops. And the reason is, is because we actually don't want to penetrate up into the main shaft of our spear shaft. And the reason for that is going to come when we start discussing the bivalved rods. But in some of the hardwood shafts, penetration is only going to be limited to the first foot or two foot anyway. And so breakages at the end are fairly common. And if you are using large river cane shafts, which were likely available to Clovis people, however, only to the southeastern most Clovis people, perhaps as far over as Texas along the Gulf Coast, and then only as far north as about northern Georgia, which you would be able to find in the Pleistocene or at the, or at the Younger Dryas, very large river cane, because out west and then the northern states as we know them today, the river cane, it's too cold of a climate and it won't grow. So modern day river cane grows about as far north as southern Ohio, sometimes getting up into Maryland a little bit uh, because it's closer to the coast and it's just slightly warmer typically. Uh, but during the Pleistocene, you would find that climates in Florida today would be much like North Carolina today. So, and that's how it would be back in the Pleistocene. So basically Florida would be like same temperature, say as North Carolina, Tennessee. And so when you look at the lines of where river cane grows, that line is gonna get shoved down and you're gonna be looking at, at the very farthest reaches of river cane, probably North Georgia, North Alabama, very, very like South Missouri possibly. Um, so they had some access to it, but then that does not account for everything north. So you could implement, as we do here, and we'll touch on this, the four shaft system into river cane, but that does not account for the hardwood shafts being used in places absent of river cane. So if we go back to these, you would not implement these with the river cane, especially because the internodal chambers, meaning the nodes on the river cane, just like bamboo, it's a North American bamboo, these very sharp points upon impact would easily jam right through those internodal chambers, which are typically fairly solid. And the best thing about like a cane shaft is it doesn't require any drilling. So there is possibility that Clovis people utilizing river cane because it's a very, very good material to use. You'll find through some of our future videos that anthropologically speaking, everybody wants to use cane if they have cane because it's just that good. But that being said, if you utilize these very sharp, uh, single beveled pointed rods into river cane that requires no drilling, 
because we don't have a drill, they'll punch through the internodal chamber, which decreases uh, penetration, which will also then split your cane shaft, rendering it essentially useless. So when you do find using uh, river cane shafts, main shafts, you're going to implement a longer fore shaft that has plenty of room for penetration into large pl Pleistocene animals. And we don't necessarily want to get out the other side of the animal. We just want to make sure that we get in far enough to deflate both lungs of the animal or cause massive damage. So if this insets into the cane about this far, we could have anywhere from honestly eight inches to 14, 15, 16 inches of penetration is more than sufficient to kill about anything, especially if you've got spears on both sides. But really importantly, the base of that foreshaft is going to be a much more blunted so it doesn't break through the internodal chamber of the cane. All right, so now we'll move on to discussing the bibeveled rods which are found in the Clovis assemblage. And that was another thought again that maybe these were lap jointed onto a spear shaft much like this one here and then utilizing this same bone splint idea to haft uh, lap joint onto the main spear shaft and then lap joint onto the projectile which we've already discussed is a, is a really inefficient way of attaching clovis points and although that lap joint is perfect for attaching rods and other spear shaft pieces together. So where does the bibeveled rod come into play? Well, as you can see on our spear shaft here, what you will notice is that when you're out hunting and you spear animals, you are oftentimes, especially with hardwood that doesn't have inset four shafts, and you may have over penetration, what you're gonna find is the wood will eventually break because as the animal gets speared, it's going to run and it's either going to hit that spear shaft on brush or other animals in the herd. It's going to be running with them in the herd and it's going to run by another one that's running this way or it's going to run past it or it's going to lean down and drag on the ground and it's going to buckle that spear shaft or it's going to fall onto the spear shaft and it's going to break it. So we see through our hunts all the time because that's what we do here at Hunt Primitive is we do a lot of primitive hunts is we break a lot of shafts. And so when you break these shafts, wood doesn't just break off super clean where you can just put it back together. And these lap joints are actually very strong joints and resist quite a bit of breakage. So if it doesn't break at the lap joint or if it does and it splits the, the lap joint, then what you're going to find is not only do you have a lot of splintering happening at the hardwood shaft, but you're going to have a lot of splits that run up through. If you take a stick and you bend it and break it, a lot of times you'll find it doesn't just break clean and stop. Sometimes as it breaks, it splinters and those cracks will run deep into the spear shaft, which severely compromise its structural integrity. And so what you can do is if you just looking at your break and you've got splits from the break, if you simply cut these and beveled them and married them together, now what happens is your spear shaft gets shorter. And you might be able to do that once and get away with it, but the length of your spear shaft is very important to the balance of how your atlatl system is when you're gonna throw it. A very short spear doesn't have the proper balance in the atlatl and tends to fly uh, relatively erratic. It's hard to be very accurate with it and tends to fly with a knock end down as you release it. And a very long spear shaft is so nose heavy that it's very hard to throw accurately without it wanting to take a nose dive. So the balance between the spear shaft and the atlatl is crucial. And so maintaining a relative length of your spear shafts that match your atlatl or your throwing component is really important. So if you have a break, what you can do is you can cut these ends off that are broken and now you can implement the use of a bi-beveled rod that now is a patch and repair on your spear shaft that allows you to maintain the same length of your spear shaft. And as we know that that's really important for balance, 
why on earth wouldn't you just make a whole new spear shaft? Well, there's a lot of work that goes into straightening spear shafts out, also fletching, dialing in, making sure they're tuned really well. Also the hafting component, which if the haft actually may not be broke, it may have penetrated into the animal and maybe the pitch came loose, but all you have to do is just reheat it and set it. So all the time that it took to half the point and the material it took to half the point, maybe that's not compromised at all, but the shaft is broke. So instead of starting over from scratch, you're going to make a repair. Well, your repairs, especially out in the plains or the tundra type uh, habitats, you're going to find wood is not as common as it is say in the east today. So anybody that's been out through the Great Plains, you can cover some pretty big distances following large mammals, especially bison, which were heavily hunted by Clovis people. If you follow these bison around, you're probably going to find yourself in locations that are absent of a lot of good quality wood. Now, some of the lower quality woods are very soft and they split easier, but they also work easier and they were probably used. But if you find yourself out on the plains or out on the tundra and you're hunting bison, or mammoths or what have you, and you have a broken spear shaft, what you're probably going to find is you have a lot of access to bone and ivory. And although it takes much longer to build that, bi-beveled rod out of bone or ivory, you also know the chances of that component breaking are relatively slim compared to the wood. And so what you would probably find is a lot more of these bi-beveled rods being utilized in places that have lower wood resources overall. So now we'll move on to discussing the actual hafting of the fluted Clovis point. So with all of our work here at Hunt Primitive, with only tools found from the Clovis assemblage, and then also the application of actually taking the time to build with stone tools and then go out and hunt with what we made, it's really easy to see how all of this comes together. When you sit and you just dream of all the ideas and the ways that you can put all of this stuff together, it's really romantic and complex and it makes you feel really smart. But when you actually try to build all of this stuff, it becomes very, very difficult. And that's why we circle right back to what we said at the beginning of this video, which is the simplest idea is oftentimes the best. And so what we found is either marrying into a thinner foreshaft, either in, inset into cane or lap jointed, so tapered, lap jointed onto a larger main shaft, but needing this for that penetration because the point will cut a channel, a wound channel, and a big shaft has a lot of friction behind it and therefore will impede penetration. So a thin shaft and the flutes are really instrumental in when we carve out our notch for that, for the, the flutes, it creates a very very slick transition. So if we look at anything that's hafted like this, this would be the side profile. You see how it's got these pronounced shoulders on the hafting area. If those shoulders were really pronounced, that would inhibit penetration as you see here, especially through big robust woolly animals. This would inhibit penetration and likely stop it altogether or it would slow it down to where it would just go a little bit further. So we see that in our real hunting application. So unless you're really a hunter and you go out and use this stuff, you don't realize that a thick shaft and that rough transition or blunt transition dramatically decreases your penetration. So very important to early peoples are to have very smooth transitions that'll slide right through the fur and the hide of the animal, slide in between uh, rib bones. If you catch that hard transition, if it had a hard transition on the side of a rib bone, that would really hit it and stop it or deflect the energy. So there's very little resistance. So having that is really important, married onto this very thin foreshaft or severely tapered main shaft. So what I've really found is two specific ways to
to half Clovis points. One is a very expedient method, which I'm not a big fan of, but I think it was probably implemented at some points. And we highlighted this in the Clovis documentary as well. And that is where we curf out the sides of our foreshaft to make a channel that we can follow with a stone flake being hammered in. So when you curf the shaft or score it and then you can tap in a stone flake the the split of the shaft will more than likely follow that kerfing and then utilizing the flutes if they're smooth fluted on both sides to a knife edge finish at the base that those will then be able to slide down in to that split in which you will still glue with pine pitch glue and then reinforce a fair amount with animal sinew, the tendons of deer, bison, or probably proboscidean. And then you'll be able to taper out the shoulders on the shaft. You'll be able to scrape them and grind them and taper them in and then kind of putty that over with your pitch as well to create a smooth transition but really some of the problems that we find with the split shafting hafting is again that tip alignment it's very hard to get perfect true spinning tip alignment like this if you take one and you spin it you can see how smooth that tip spins and that's really good for penetration because there's no torquing at that point where if it was wobbly when you spin it then like if it was going like this when you were spinning it and I'm trying to exaggerate that, then that's where you're going to have, it's going to torque over and it's going to snap your point or it's going to snap your haft or it's going to snap your fore shaft or what have you. And so the split shaft is much more difficult to get true tip alignment. And I believe it would be more of a, hey, there's animals there. We need to finish this stuff up. We're watching the herd. They're moving off. We're going to have to catch them. We need to refit these relatively fast to go do it. You could score and split and have them together very quickly. Where likewise, I don't think that that occurred very often or it was an earlier, more rudimentary style of hafting, but more so using a saw made from blade core technology from the Clovis assemblage, which is found. It only takes about an hour to cut out a notch with a stone saw and then using little flakes to kind of clean it up and then also it creates this perfect little mound kind of right in the center uh, because you can't get the saw in there flat it's more like an angle like this and you flip it back and forth and so it kind of creates a little triangle on the inside which then also fits that bifurcated base often found in Clovis points and then these will slide down in very tight fitting and you can see how smooth of a transition this is and so there's nothing to hang up and it's really well supported if the point has long flutes especially if they're hinged flutes uh, as opposed to feathered out flutes but feathered out flutes work as well this one has uh, a hinged flute on one side and closer to a feather out on the other and this process still works very very well and it only takes about an hour with stone tools to cut this out. So the benefits of penetration are well worth the hour it takes to cut and shave this down. Really doesn't take that long at all, even with the stone tools. And again, we're going to put this together with pitch glue, and then we're going to wrap back here along the ground blunted uh, hafting area with sinew, and then also reinforce the shaft because the pressure when when this hits an animal, especially if it hits bone or rib bone or something, it'll drive the point backwards and it could split the shaft. So it's very important that we wrap behind it to secure it from splitting. And we wrap that again with animal tendons with sinew. But that's really the most efficient way I've found to haft Clovis points or really any pro projectile, but especially Clovis with hinge flutes that it fits so perfectly in no transitional hang-ups, which is really good for penetration of big, robust, woolly animals. Now there's also a method of hafting called a bend break style of haft, and that's where you would cut, uh, you'd have to have a longer stick, so you have a little, you can use this with a little bit of leverage, but if you wanted to say haft a point on the end of this, you would cut um, 
a groove on this side and then turn it 90 degrees and then you'd slide down where you want the haft and you would cut it and you kind of bend it back and forth and then this way and you can break it and it'll pop that section out. That's a viable method of hafting as well and absolutely that's also seen in later archaic times. But also in those later archaic times you're seeing points that are napped relatively thin but the base is still thicker than what would be used on a fluted paleo point. But with the fluted points that have a, a much steeper knife edge to haft into, getting those bend breaks to break and not actually be too wide where you have a lot of wallowing is very difficult, especially on heavily fluted or deeply fluted Clovis era points. So trying to bend break out that perfect little sliver and then also to have it taper which would also be important uh, because for the structural integrity you don't need to have a big wide notch. So here would be the issue. We'll draw this one in real time. If you did a bend break style and say it knocked out a chunk out of your main shaft like this but the fluting creates and this will be the side profile of your Clovis point. So that's a side profile. Let's put a couple little hinge flutes and we're not going to set it all the way in because I want you to see what it looks like. And obviously that's not very straight, but these are often, if the cross section comes down to a very fine point. Now remember this is this, this is the side profile. So we're not looking at it like this. We're looking at it like this. And so when these are fluted, oftentimes these better uh, fluted Clovis points, much like this one here, they're going to come down to that really fine, knife edge. And so if we set that down in, now all of a sudden there's a lot of wallowing that can happen. And I do believe that this is another expedient method that could be used. All of that could be filled with pitch, with your pine pitch glue. And But the problem you're going to really find with this that I found is in real application when you thin this spear shaft say like that and you're going to grind these down because remember these shoulders are really bad for penetration so when you grind these ends down okay like this we grind these ends down you're finding much weaker hinge points right here because it's been wallowed out and on top of that in order to make this bend break style of half you had to score here, which doesn't matter because it snapped off, but you also had to score here. So there's still a little bit of side scoring. So this becomes a very, very weak union and also, which is probably fine on later archaic animals hunting stuff like the smaller bison or deer or that kind of stuff. But when you're talking about hunting very large Pleistocene animals, I wouldn't want to have any of these as weak hafting areas. I wouldn't want any weak links in my system if I could help it. So rather than that, what I want to do is I want to create a shaft that I can cut in with a stone saw, which is relatively easy to do, and it naturally creates, just like we did this one here with a stone saw, it naturally creates this taper. We can wallow every bit of it out that we want, but then as we get down to the base, as you can see, it comes down to a fine point. And you can also see that there's, although it's very thin up here for penetration, it's still thicker on the sides for when we slide in the projectile. And I think I got it backwards in there, but when we slide in the projectile, you can still see it's got a little bit of support, but without having any sort of hangups in the transition. And so that's exactly how we would want to set in. And I'm going to overlay probably another picture. Either this one's good enough. I do have another picture as well um, that I recently posted on social media that's probably a good illustration. But what we really want is this half to be cut out. And then again, it only takes about an hour. So it sets in, and then also, if we have hinge fluted, a hinge fluted Clovis, this is again the side profile, not the front profile, but the side, the hinge flutes are going to actually set, and it doesn't take long to do this, and we did it on this one. The hinges of the flute, as you can see here, you can see that slight hinge, I cut this 
to fit when it sets down in, it sets right on top of that hinge. Now the hinges on this flute, on these flutes are not very severe. However, on this point that I napped actually had really significant hinges. And so now we actually have a point of contact at the base. So we're getting resistance when this thing hits onto the target, onto the animal, especially if it hits bone. It's wrapped with sinew for reinforcement. It's got a point of contact at the base, but it also has now a point of contact with the shaft at these hinge flutes as well. And that would be very hard to replicate with the bend break style of hafting being used, especially if you're already making big game hunting implements and you're implementing this technology, taking only an hour to cut a perfectly fit haft is a great allocation of your time. As you can see, this is a nice fit cut with stone tools onto an actual cast of a Clovis point and it fits very cleanly and that only takes about an hour. So it's a great allocation of time. Take the time, build your spear set correctly, half the point correctly. So then probably the last thing to mention is why don't you find a lot of these four shafts then? And remember this being not a four shaft, this being a projectile needed for penetration because the tip would be soft and roll upon penetration, therefore not penetrating if it was wood. So needing a hard tip bone antler or ivory is really important. If you were to make a four shaft like this out of wood, it really wouldn't, it would not survive uh, 11,000 years of being put in the ground. So it's going to disintegrate essentially. That's why we don't have wood components from the Clovis assemblage and fewer bone antler and ivory where then we have all the lithics of course because they don't degrade. But why you wouldn't have notched out four shafts, say like this one, made out of bone or ivory is the fact that now you've just taken something that was really simple and it took about an hour to cut this notch and inset this in, it would take many hours. You would have a day invested in taking a piece of bone or ivory, splitting it out, grinding it down. You'd have more than a day. You'd have that just creating, just creating this rod with Stone Age tools. You'd have about a day into one of these with just stone flakes and also grinding. And uh, we have a video on making these as well for whatever that's worth to you. But very long time to make these bone antler or ivory projectiles. So the, to make them make four shafts out of bone antler or ivory and then notch them. And then once you notch them, it's a custom fit to the Clovis point. So even if your four shaft survives, but say your, your tip snaps off or you completely break the point or it comes out and you lose it, now it doesn't really fit the other shafts. So it took you hours and hours and hours and hours to make a bone antler or ivory four shaft that now has served its life and it's, oh, and it's done. And you can't use it anymore unless you cut it down or modify it. Where if you just grabbed a piece of short wood that you lap jointed on, then you can make this in an hour. So that's why you're not gonna find these bone antler ivory actual four shafts. What you find are the projectile points, which is this, and then the bi-beveled rods, which are very unlikely to break and they're not a custom fit. So that's why there is gonna be an absence of actual bone antler or ivory four shafts. All right, folks, well, I hope you enjoyed the discussion today. I know it was a lot, but we absolutely went through the entire assemblage of the hafting components or the beveled rods, the bi-beveled rods, and then the fluting itself. And of course, four shafting techniques with the stone drills and the lap joints and all that kind of stuff and looking at the things that weren't included in the Clovis assemblage also. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it, uh, you took some good value from it. Also, again, if you haven't watched the full length Clovis documentary, but you like this kind of discussion, that's a great one. It's a little less discussion like this and it's a little bit more action within the build and then the go hunt. So if you haven't watched it, the link's down in the description and uh, hopefully we'll catch you on either the next adventure or the next lecture.